Jeff, hello, man. How you doing? Doing good. Um, Go. is my, does my brightness look okay? Yeah, like, looks good to me, man. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, if you if you like share, depending on who shares, like I'm at the top when I host, and you're at the you're at the top yeah, when you host. Yeah. yeah, I know, I know how that is. Are what up, Gary? Doing? Gary of the Goo. All right, so uh, let's let's get right into it, dude. Yeah, absolutely. So, guys, we've been talking. Uh, Jeff and I were talking about a couple of things that would we think be useful for y'all. Jeff came up with some really good ideas, um, and a lot of them come down to preparation and the way that you use your time to prepare for specific things that a drummer might do. Things like playing a gig, um, things like auditioning for a gig, things like recording. Uh, and I think we've got a lot of ideas, a lot of tips that I think could be really helpful. Jeff, do you wanna go first? Yeah, yeah, actually. So uh, so my band just did an EP uh, that we released a couple weeks ago. Uh, we did it ourselves. So I recorded the drums, not in this studio, but in the last studio room before we had to move because of COVID. Hi, Jordan. And uh, so that's all released, and now we're going to go in to do an LP. And in preparation for the studio, um, long story short, I use a program called Sound Slice, which if you've watched the, the podcast before, I've talked a lot about the program because it's free and it's super helpful. I actually just got done tracking all the drums. Um, it probably took me like four or five hours or something like that. Um, but I tracked all the drums in Sound Slice, so note for note. So um, essentially, like, probably – the end of this week like this well maybe not this weekend but beginning of next week i can just take my flat screen tv put it in front of my drum kit right here and i can just practice along and get those parts down okay that's yeah. benefit number one benefit number two is i can record my screen and send the band the wave file of the exact drum part to a metronome exactly how it's going to be played and they can make the scratch tracks that i will play along to the demo on Right. So, so if you're, so what I'm saying is, if you are going in the studio, there's a lot of things that you should have. One is you should know BPMs. Yep. You should have really, really clean scratch tracks, and you should have as little ambiguity about the parts you're going to play as possible. Don't go in and just say, "Well, I'm just going to do what I feel." You might be stressed. You yeah. might have to take a shit. You might be hungry. You might, you know, a lot of stuff happens. You're on the clock. You're going to have to really, really hammer it down. So I'm eliminating all the like. Uh, object, not uh, pitfalls, obstacles. That's what it is. It wasn't objection. Right, obstacles. Right. I'm removing all obstacles so I can just go in there and do my thing. Yeah. So um, those are some really good points. I've got some things to add to that. Um, everything Jeff said makes a lot of sense. And to kind of add on to that without kind of overlapping with what he said is um, there's the concept of amateur versus professional, right? And when you're going into the studio, when you're recording, whether it's on your dollar or somebody else's dollar, you want to go in there with the mindset of a professional. And what defines a professional is the, the difference in practice, the difference in how well you've mastered your part. An amateur practices something until they get it right. A professional practices it until they no longer get it wrong. And that's the mindset you need to approach recording in a studio with. When, can if, we call you on you can, that? Do what? Can we call you on that? Yeah, absolutely. I didn't come up with that. Um, Okay, I was like, I was like, if you did, that's real good, my man. Yeah, yeah, you know, I patented, but no, I didn't come up with that. I wish I did, but um, who, who, who actually said that? I don't know, man. I read it on a random comment um, and a YouTube thread once. I'm sure the person who wrote it from somebody else, but it's it's it makes a lot of sense, and it it had a big impact on me when I read that um, because when I was younger, I was practicing all the time, and I still practice all the time, but I was super mm -hmm. super serious about getting better, um, and I found myself working super hard and yet not being able to play the same things that other drummers who practiced less than me could play. And I didn't understand why. Um, and the reason was exactly that statement. I was, uh, I was focusing on like a billion things and getting decent at a billion different things, but not really mastering any single thing. Right. Um, and so when I, when I read that statement, it really brought that to light. And I realized it's not enough to, you know, practiced on holy confessions by Vince Semple until you can get it you know sounding okay if you want to really be good at it you need to practice it until you get every single aspect of it flawless 10 times out of 10 when you play it and that's yeah that's what you need to do when you're going into the studio if you've got something that you're going to play in the studio if you've got a song you need to be able to play that song perfect every time with very minimal effort because going back to what Jeff said you don't want to be pushing yourself in the studio um you you need to you need to be using less than 100% of your ability because in the studio, you're going to be in a foreign environment. You're going to be working with people that you probably don't know. 
you're going to be working with equipment that may not be your own. And even if it is, it probably isn't set up exactly the way you're used to. So there's exactly. a lot of different external factors. You might be sick that day. You might have an allergy infection. You might not have eaten yet. Your girlfriend just broke up with you. Who knows? And all these factors affect your ability to play accurately and effectively. So if you go into the studio knowing that you're going to have to use 100% of your ability, then if any of those things goes wrong, you're not going to have access to 100% of your ability. You're going to have access to 90% of your ability or 80 it's, or 70. The more we talk about this, the more it sounds like the best metaphor is like being an athlete. Yeah. Because if you're that fucking, you know, ego driven person who's like, I don't need to practice. I don't need to lift weights. I'm amazing. When it comes to game time, like you're going to pull something, you're going to get injured. You're going to fall flat on your face. You're going to let your team down. And I hate sports. Well, I don't watch any sports. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't stand it. And that's a different conversation. But I think that you have to train. We're talking about training. And I think there's right. different forms of training for different, like if you're, if you're going to scrimmage, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to go all out in a scrimmage. Right. But if it's the fucking world series, or the Super Bowl, or something like that, then of course you are. So I think uh, that's a good segue into uh, an audition. Yeah. And shameless, shameless plug number two for good old sound slice. Yeah. If you don't know how to read drum music, hit up Nick, hit up myself. We have videos on it. There's help videos online. You knowing how to read music is huge because when I auditioned for this current band here in Austin, Texas, I took the old drummer's parts for the three songs they wanted me to use for the audition. And I tracked them all in sound slice. And I listened yeah. back and I, and I practiced along to the parts. You know, I had my laptop right up next to me and I was practicing everything for the audition. So when I went to the audition, I had my laptop. I had like my cheat sheet. Okay. Right. Yep. If you go to an audition right. blind, it's the, it's the exact same thing as the studio, except you're not laying down the drums. That's your first impression. So if you're fumbling over the parts or you're like, oh shit, I just had this fill. I was working on it to your point earlier, but I didn't play it until I didn't get it wrong. I just played it until I got it right. Okay. Well now guess what? The next guy is going to get that get that audition he's going to get that gig with that band because you didn't have a cheat sheet yep so so how about, how about for for auditions when you have to audition for something yeah, what do you what so do you do the cheat prep sheet's a great for? idea cheat sheet's a great idea What's um, up, guys? It's, always, it's always good to over prepare it's better to have too much knowledge than not enough right um and i want to take that a step further and talk about some non-drumming related things that you should do to prepare um get to know the people uh if they've got facebook profiles go check them out on facebook you know um, figure out it, when, when, when you're auditioning for a band, it's not enough to be able to play the part unless you're at playing, you know, at like, um, like, uh, like bar gigs, right? If you're, if you're auditioning for a band that's going to be touring or that's going to be recording in the studio, or that's going to have any kind of, uh, like a public presence, then you've got to play the parts, but you've also got to look the part. Image is a big deal in music. It's a big deal. And so if, if you're someone who's auditioning for a band that wears face paint and you refuse to wear face paint, that <laughs> even if you can play the parts perfectly, you're probably not getting that gig. So you need you're to- You're like, I'm gonna play an ICP, you. but I'm not gonna wear any of the, exactly. the clown makeup. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you, you need to be able to fit the part. You've got to fit the image. If you're in a hair metal band, you know, you you need to get a wig or you need to grow your hair out into hair metal size, you know? Um, yep. You got to be able to fit the image because those people, when you're in a band, especially if it's a touring band, that band is a brotherhood. You know, uh, and that sounds super cheesy. But when I what I mean by that is you're going to end up spending tremendous amount of time with those people. And if you mm -hmm. can't get along with them, it's not going to work no matter how good you are. You know, so you need you need to be able to get along with them and you need to be able to look the part. And of course, you need to be able to play the part as well. That's obviously the most important thing. But I can't tell you how many um, how many stories I've read online and how many times I've talked to Johnny Rab about, you know, people going to these auditions and nailing the parts and still not getting hired. And the answer, yeah. is they didn't fit the part, they didn't look the part, or they didn't get along with the guys well enough, you know? So you got to be yeah. able to fit all of those slots. Play the part, look the part, get along. All three. That's really good, really good feedback. Because also that alleviates some of the concerns or issues you can run into later on because I didn't play to a metronome in my audition. Right. And I was like, I was like, so I, and I was nervous, of course, so I rushed. And then at the end of it, I remember the guitar player who's super outspoken and super direct was just like, that doesn't sound like the song at all. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, holy shit, I have like, and I got defensive because I was like, well, I have Sound Slice in front of me. Like I have the music that was kind of my crutch, but I was like, it's hard to play the music wrong when I have the, ch I can play it back synthetic if you want. Like that's, and he's like, no, 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 I think I said it wrong. It's not that you played it wrong. It was just way too fast. And we played it again. He's oh, like, oh, that's right. And they offered me the gig like during that 
uh, during the audition. Like at the end of that, I wasn't expecting it. But what I'm saying is um, I agree with you 100%. Uh, know the part, look the part. Um, what was the third thing? You got to get along with the guys or girls. Get along with the guys. And see, the reason why I forgot that is because I don't prioritize it, honestly. Yeah. I can look the part and know my parts, but as far as getting to know you, I think that's where I have an area of growth is yeah. – I feel like you need to have a relationship. You need to prioritize a relationship because you're going to be spending an ass load of time with these people. Yeah. So if you don't like each other, like there's been a couple of times, I don't know if you've been in this situation, but I did not want to be in a band with somebody because I don't, I just don't get along with them at all. Like I don't want to yeah. be around them. So yeah. um, that's nothing. So let's talk about, um, so we talked about getting ready for an audition and getting ready for the studio. How about for a live gig? Yeah. For when, a when, live when, gig. A lot, live gig is going to be a lot of similar things. You know, you're going to have a specific image that you're going for with the band that matters. You also want to be able to master the part and not make any mistakes. But if we assume, no, Johnny. if we assume that you're already doing those things, another thing that I would consider is get to know the venue that you're playing in, right? Because yeah. the most frustrating thing as a drummer is setting your gear up and taking your gear down, and the logistics of how you get your stuff in and out, and uh, when you do it, the time, you know, the load in time, and all of these things. Um, it's a very overlooked aspect of playing live. People, you know, focus on, sure. you know, how fast is your double bass? And, you know, can you play a single stroke roll at 225 BPM? Um, and all that stuff matters, but there's so much more behind the scenes that goes on to playing live. You know, you need to be able to play the part. And you need to look badass, but you've also got to be able to get in efficiently. And that's something that, um, that always frustrated me when I was younger because I had an unusually large drum kit when I was 17 and uh, it always took me forever to get my stuff in and out. And when the shows were over, when the band that was supposed to play after my band was going on, it always took me longer than the other drummers to get my stuff down because I wasn't, uh, I wasn't prioritizing the logistics. I didn't have my kit set up in such a way that I could take it down easily. And it made the other band take longer to get on. And that meant that they started late. And that was because of me, that was my fault, you know? Yeah. So you need to well, figure that stuff out as a drummer, because as a drummer, you're going to be the one that takes the longest to set up and you're going to be the one that takes the longest to take down. So you need to set your gear up in ergonomic ways and, uh, you know, maybe invest in some extra equipment or some nicer stands that you can take down and put up more quickly and efficiently use memory locks. So you don't have to sit there and fiddle with a symbol angle 25 times to get it perfect. You get symbol lock and get it right every time. So all here's a thought. Comment. Here's a thought an extension of what you're saying less is more don't yeah, bring yeah. every fucking thing you own <laughs> to the gig yeah bring don't bring your gig. third bass drum and your seventh tom and your 19th cymbal like do you really need all that shit yeah like exactly. you, like honestly like I, i've played gigs with a 20 inch trash crash and a ride cymbal and and and, and, a, and i didn't think i had a rack tom i think i just had a, a floor tom yeah and then i, I mean that, that wasn't it i had kick snare hi-hat but it like all you need is like like Nate Smith. If you look at Nate Smith, what is the biggest drum kit you've ever seen Nate Smith play? He's maybe got three crashes that are on a on a bad day. He's got kick, snare, hats, and a ride, and maybe one one of the crash. That, that's it. And he sounds amazing. So it's not. It's like that part in The Departed where he's talking about the. Um, yes, you don't need Portnoy's live you don't setup. Need Portnoy's it's, setup. If you got Portnoy's drum tech and they're setting it up for you, then go for it. But otherwise, that's another, no. that's another story. That, that remind me to talk about roadies in a second. But one yeah. one thing from the part is he said we don't use automatic weapons. It doesn't add inches to your dick. It it carries a life sentence. Okay, <laughs> if, you, if you if you can go into a situation with a thirty eight special, and it's a six shot or eight shot or whatever, that's fine. You don't need to go in there with an AK. You know what I mean? Like like bring the right tool for the job. Like if the music really dictates that much then that's a segue into my next thing. Hire a college kid who needs money. Uh, get your friend, you know, spot him 20 bucks to just be your roadie river. I'm sure you've been at gigs and I've been at gigs where I'm literally too tired to stand. Yep. I, had, I had one where my chest was so constricted, I thought I was going to pass out and I had to <coughs> lift my drums from this stage that was like seven or eight feet off the ground. Yep. So it can be a nightmare. So sometimes like, hey, I'll give you 20 bucks to help me load in and I'll buy you a beer when you get there. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. Like, just help me carry my shit. You know, that way we're, we're timely. We're not holding up other bands, like you said. I get a free drink out of it. Um, I get access to the show for free so I can watch all the bands. Like, you know, I'm sure you got a music friend who can help you out. But that can make a big difference. Yeah, it does. It absolutely does. Um, I, I had a, a friend like that that was helping me at one point. Um, and having someone assist you taking up stuff and taking down is such a big deal. I mean, there's a reason why every professional drummer – uh, has a drum tech and it's because it makes your life better. It just makes it a whole lot better. And speaking 
of drums, guys, we do want to talk about our next topic, which is some warm-up uh, lessons and some warm-up techniques. Um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to show you, Jeff. I've got one here um, that I discovered recently that I learned from Luke Holland. So I got to meet Luke Holland in L.A. this past um, – well, not this summer, but the summer before last, so the summer of 2019. And nice. he showed me a um, – well, I, I say he showed me. We, there was a, a bunch of us. So he showed everyone in this group um, this warm-up thing that he learned from uh, August Burns Red's drummer. And it uh, was like this, okay? Matt so, Gren Grenier or whatever his yes, name is? Yeah, yeah, Gren yeah. Grenier, yeah. Griner? Uh, Griner, Griner. So you can do this with your hands, and you can also do it with your feet. You should do it with both. But um, it's not just a warm-up exercise. It's also good for developing speed. But the way it goes is you play eight strokes with your right hand. Let me go down to my practice pad. There we go. All right, so eight strokes with your right hand, and then eight strokes with your left and then eight strokes unison, and then eight strokes is a single stroke roll. So the whole thing is this. And then repeat. And this is really, really good because it focuses on all the things you need to be able to do with your hands. You need to be able to play solo with your right hand. You need to be able to play solo with your left hand. You've also got to be able to play tight unisons, and you need to be able to play tight single strokes. So it's, it's like all the hand technique that you need in one simple, you know, quick exercise, really good for warming up, really good for developing speed and endurance. Um, and that, that I would highly recommend checking that out and learning it. Can you do that exercise again, but can you cut it in half? So instead of eight, it's, uh, then go to four. Absolutely. You don't have to. So you yeah. can go, uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yeah. 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 That would be like this. Also, you, you probably want to start with your left hand, too, and lead with your left on some of the single strokes. That's always very important. Everything you do with your right, you should do with your left. Oh, so, okay. So, yeah, because I'm thinking of, like, okay, doing eights, right-hand lead, fours, right-hand lead, stop, eights, left-hand lead, four, or uh, fours, left-hand lead, stop, and repeat. That's yeah, a really – yeah, and actually, I didn't even think about doing that with your feet. I actually yeah, just did that uh, – video I did last night was sim similar to that. Just something where you can sit down and just get the blood flowing through the feet, get the joints loosened up, get comfortable. You know, if you need to adjust anything, like I changed the angle on my bass drum when I do that. So that can help you like change the angle on your snare or, you know, choke up on the stick or whatever you got to do. Absolutely. Nice, dude. Doing it with your feet is so good because unison strokes are done all the time with your hands. But unison strokes oh, yeah. are done that often with your feet, you know, and, it's really good practice. It's really, especially when you're developing your technique, because when you're developing your technique, your left foot is going to be way behind your right foot. But if you do unisons, you can both feel and see where your left foot is falling short. You know, is the angle of your heel wrong? Are you, you know, fo are you tensing up? You know, because you can compare your feet because they're doing the same motion at the same time. So it's really, really good yeah. for troubleshooting in that regard. Um, can I, can I do something unscripted real quick? Sure. I mean, I'm going to do it anyway, but, you know. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't know how the live drum set's going to sound on, um, on this, but since I'm right here, I want to show you. What up, Kinara? All right. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. It looks good. Okay. So, so I was messing around with something, and, and I'll, play, uh, I'll play the cross stick so it's not as long. But, all right. Okay. So let's, let's take, like, take a bass drum pattern like uh, – Okay? Okay. And just switch it to the hi-hat. And then I was thinking, um, you can also practice with, uh, like, and I, I'm not good at this yet at all, but, like, kind of moving the beat around and, and started, like, a... You know, you kind of like, like I was like, why, why don't we hear more drummers like play the uh, hi, play the hi hat in place of the of the bass drum stroke? Right, because that, that actually I adds like a whole other layer of the groove. Yeah, like because this is a sound you don't normally hear that that bark at, at, in place of like a, a you know.
Right. No, no, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. So I, my warm up exercise, which I really like that, uh, that I'm going to, I'm going to use that one actually, because like, I don't warm up. It's kind of like stretching before exercising, you know, what up Colby. Um, but yeah, that's, it, it's, it just, it feels really good too. It feels like it's a great. All right, so uh, I think Jeff lost connection there for a second, guys. But what he was going over is basically just talking about different ways to utilize that uh, that warm up technique, which is all just very very useful. Um, basically, you always want to focus on uh, on uh, unisons. You really want to focus on making your unisons tight and accurate, because if your unisons turn into flams, which of course is where two strokes hit one after the other. You don't want that. You want clean unisons. When you want flams, you need flams. But you need to be able to distinguish between a flam and a unison, which is what Jeff was about to go over. So let's get him back in here. <clears throat> hey, Jeff. What's up? Hey, welcome back. All right, so I was going over um, countdown. So I'm um, starting with eight and then going down to seven, six, five. So uh, then go to seven. Yeah. Six, five, four. It's hard to say it and do it at the same time. So you could do also um, flams. So oh man, I've never seen that with flams before. That's cool. Yeah, so you can you can do that, and then as soon as you get like, or you could even do um, like accented, like you could do bucks instead, and a buck is just uh, where you have uh, lower notes and you have accents on there too. So you could go. Uh, so it'd be I guess you'd have to start on the two. That's really useful. Or you could even move it too if you really wanted to. You could go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Or right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you could do that. I mean, there's endless amounts of. Uh, but as soon as you get like, if you really want to develop like like your finger um, dexterity, then you can play it at like super fast tempos. Obviously, that's a little bit harder, but um, yeah, that's that's a really good way of uh, you're kind of giving your hand a break because you're playing less notes each time. Or if you played, obviously, a li little bit harder. But then if you go back to playing singles for girls. You already have that. Your fingers are like super, super uh, loose. Everything's really relaxed. And then imagine you do uh, both of the exercises we went over on your hands and your feet. You're going to be ready to record. You're going to be ready to audition. You're going to be ready to play a gig. Load up, you know, right after you just loaded in your drums, every, you know, everything's all tight. You want to loosen it up. Great way of uh, great way of getting that done. Yeah. So that, that brings me to the next one I wanted to show you, which is similar to that. Um, because it's going from one to seven or one to eight. 
Uh, I, Johnny Rab showed me this, and um, it, it goes like this. So imagine, let me go back to my practice pad. My fancy, there we go. So if, uh, if I play eight strokes with the right hand, well, I, not eight strokes, but just constant strokes, actually. You want to interject single strokes with the left hand at uh, like one single stroke and then two and then three, et cetera, et cetera. So the, what I'm talking about would be this. One, two, three. So you're playing, <coughs> excuse me, the right hand is constantly playing singles. Yeah. And the left hand alternates just from, you know, one single stroke, two single stroke, all the way up to seven. And then you do the same with your left hand. And, you know, you repeat it nice. right hand, left hand. It's what's useful about that is that it, it benefits your technique, uh, obviously, because you're focusing on playing. But also you kind of have to really think at the same time because it's not immediately intuitive whether you're playing three strokes, four strokes, five strokes, et cetera. You kind of have to think about it as you play it, which forces you to split your brain between concentrating on the playing and also concentrating on the thinking and the counting and the ability to do those, those, uh, those mental processes at the same time in parallel makes your playing tighter because now you force yourself to be able to play the part while only using 50% of your brain, you know? Uh, and once you get that to, is to a do foot that cleanly, once you take crazy. the time away, you're really good. That is a foot exercise. That would be nuts. That is a foot exercise. Yes. Because you, you can actually alternate it. Because if you're, if you're, yeah, if you're, absolutely. if you're right, that, 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 that's yeah, that's yeah, it. Absolutely. It's just really what up, sick. guys? Welcome. All right, so we need to uh, wrap up here soon, but let's talk about uh, real quick for for the viewers, either now or on YouTube. Um, what tuning advice can you impart? Like, what's what's on your mind right now as far as uh, tuning tips? Yeah. So if we're if we're going like one quick tip, you know, um, the biggest thing I would I would say is don't overthink it. Don't don't spend hundreds you know well not hundreds but don't spend tons and tons of hours focusing on tuning a single drum um because you can get bogged down in the weeds of getting every single tension rod perfectly to a specific pitch uh and ultimately that's a ton of work for a very small benefit you know so i would my advice would be don't overthink it make the big changes that have the big impact and unless you're super, super serious about a specific sound, don't focus so much on the small things. That's good advice, man. Um, and I'm sure you've been in a spot, and I will admit that I'm in, I've been in the spot too. Sometimes you don't know what the fuck you're doing, and you don't know how you made it sound good. <laughs> but when you play it, sounds good, yep. and it doesn't sound bad, and that's the whole. That's the biggest thing. But I think um, I think one tuning tip that we haven't gone over before: every drum has its own personality. You could be the world's best bass drum tuner, and that's great until you tune a Birch Babinga bass drum, and you know, what the, and you can't make it sound good. It's it's because you know it's not all black and it's not all black and white ones and zeros. Like you have you have to listen to the drum. If it sounds choked off, I'm sure there's woods that sound amazing at any tuning range. Like my my snare right now, I could tune it low, high, whatever. There's other snares that sound like absolute trash when they're tuned too low. There's not built for it. You know, but and some some drums you're 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 tuning it at the wrong frequency. You're making it medium tension because that's the way you've always done it. And you got a brass snare drum, and it's going to sound amazing when you crank the shit out of it. Because our steel snare drums the same way. Steel snare drums notoriously sound like a million dollars when you crank them up. Yeah. So if you're playing low, you know, or medium, maybe it's not going to sound that good. So so take it take a drum. If you're watching, take a drum off your drum set. One, maybe one that you can't uh, get tuned right and just start fucking around with it. Uh, lower uh, tension on the bottom head, loose on the top, even, both, use a drum dial, use a drum key, watch videos, do whatever you need to do. But just get to know your drums on like a personal level because all of them are different. That's very true. Very good advice. I mean, don't, don't, like, don't like have sex with your drums. Like don't, don't like be inappropriate, you know, like keep, keep, it, keep it PC, but you know, like be intimate right. with them. You know of course. Mean? Yeah. 
No, that's good advice. And it's good clarification there at the end. That's very important. We don't want people to get confused. <clears throat> anyway, um, I <laughs> those are some, some good points, Jeff. Some good points. <clears throat> Auntie, welcome, buddy. Yeah, I, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Sorry about that. No, you're good. You're good. All right. So uh, what else we got? I think that's all we got, man. All right, cool. Uh, well, as always, next week, uh, 8 p.m. Central, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern time, we will be uh, bringing you another podcast. So until then, sayonara, happy drumming. Thanks, Nick. All right. Have a good one, guys. See you later. Okay.